Hey, welcome back to online worship on this fourth Sunday of Advent. We hope that you enjoy this special online worship service as we celebrate our Advent music and the word service. Christmas Eve candlelight services are coming up on Christmas Eve at 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. Uh, reservations are required if you attend in person. Uh, the choir will be singing at 7 p.m. and masks are required. Our 9 p.m. service will serve communion. During our Christmas Eve services, we're going to be collecting the denominational's annual uh, special offering called the Christmas Joy Offering, in addition to our regular tithes and offerings. And you can read more about that in our community life. Also, for our on-live Christmas Eve worship service, we'll be doing something a little different, a little special. We will be live streaming the 7 p.m. Christmas Eve service, meaning that you can watch it live. You've got to watch it right at 7 p.m. real time on our YouTube channel or on our website. The service will also be posted afterwards, the recording of the live service, if you weren't able to catch it right at 7 p.m. But we look forward to celebrating the birth of, of the Christ child with you uh, this Christmas season, either online or in person. Let us pray. Almighty God, you wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature. In your mercy, by the power of the Holy Spirit, grant that we may share in the divine life of Jesus Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity, and who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. Now we will have the lighting of our fourth Advent candle. We prepare the way of the Lord. We light this candle in love, the love that Jesus our Savior has for us. Prepare then the way, way of the Lord.
We read in the second chapter of Titus, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all and teaching us to renounce what is evil in this world. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin together. God of grace and truth, in Jesus Christ, you came among us as light shining in darkness. We confess that we have not welcomed the light or trusted good news to be good. We have closed our eyes to glory in our midst, expecting little and hoping for less. Forgive our doubt and renew our hope so that we may receive the fullness of your grace and live in the truth of Christ our Lord. Let's take a few moments of silence to go inside the quiet of our own hearts, confessing our sin to our forgiving and loving God. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ, our Savior, gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from our sin and claim us as his own people. So be at peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. children, what are some things that we do to get ready for Christmas? Let's hear what they had to say. Hmm, back of my feet. I got a I hang lights. We make some cookies and, and we make milk for Chris, for Santa. We decorate our Christmas tree, and then we have a big tree out in the front of our yard that we also decorate. Um, we decorate our house, our tree, make cookies, and make for it. And um, Santa gave us presents for Christmas. We put gifts under the tree. We decorate a tree and um, put lights out on our yard, and the elves come back. You, you see you see the elf on the shelf fluttering and and ha and and I have lasers laser lights basically basically little red and green dots on my on my house they're so sparkly for Santa Claus wow. we make cookies and we decorate um our Christmas tree thanks for sharing we all have lots going on this time of year Maybe you're in the Nutcracker or a Christmas concert. There could be a big Christmas party coming up. Oh, and Christmas shopping too. Wow, there's a lot to do. Sometimes we get so busy at this time of year that not much else fits into our lives. There isn't time to do everything. 
All these things we do are the marbles. Now let's try to put God in there. Ugh, it doesn't close. There just isn't room for God too. Now let's see what happens if we put God in first. This represents God. Now let's add all of our activities in. Wow, look at this. If we put God first, then everything else falls right in. If you put God first in your life, everything else will fall into place. Remember this week when you get really busy, put God into your life first by praying first, reading your Bible first, and he will help you fit all the other things in too. Have a great week. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. H.G. Wells once made this observation. I must confess, as a historian, this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is the most dominant figure in all of history. So who's at the center of your story? Who does your life revolve around? Does Jesus light up your life and your way? And how much exposure to sunlight rays are you getting? Blaise Pascal put it this way, Jesus Christ is the object of all things, the center towards which all things tend. We feel empty when we make ourselves the center. We're happy in God when Christ is at the center of our lives. So Christmas reminds us that our life begins with Christ, our life continues in Christ, and our life ends in Christ. Jesus is the center and the circumference of our lives, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. And so when our lives don't orbit around Christ, we find ourselves out of kilter, at odds with the universe. As the sun is the center of the solar system, so Jesus, the Son of God, is the center of God's universe. And he's to be the center of our lives. He is our delight and our desire. And it's there that we find ourselves surprised by joy.
In the first chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, he tells of the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, I don't know about you, but as we get closer to December 21st, winter solstice, which is the longest night of the year, it, the harder it is for me to get out of bed on those dark mornings. And uh, one of my favorite parts of winter is Christmas because of the way that it lightens us and it warms us, whether it be the progression of candles during the Advent season or uh, seeing homes decorated with lights and wreaths outside, singing the great carols to one another of joy, peace, and mercy mild, or gathering with family and friends, the expectation for not only presents, but the birth of the Christ child once again. The hope of Christ's arrival gives us that motivation to literally and figuratively get out of bed each morning. The Japanese, in fact, have a word for that. It's called ikigai. What gets you up out of bed each day? See, without Christmas, winter just wouldn't be as merry. C.S. Lewis, he thought so too. Describing the reign of the White Witch in his classic, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe from the Chronicles of Narnia, where he describes Narnia under the witch's reign as always winter and never Christmas. Christmas arrives to break the spell of the witch. And so we're assured that the ice and the snow will melt and that the sin of our darkness will be lightened so that we can once again gather together around the warmth and the glow of the radiant Christ child.
prophet Isaiah writes, for a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Presbyterian pastor and author Frederick Beekner tells a great story about a Christmas pageant. It was that vintage Sunday school reenactment of the nativity, not unlike our pageant last week. The manger was down in front of the chancel steps. A baby doll wrapped in a blanket was the little Lord Jesus. Mary was there in her obligatory blue shawl, seated next to Joseph. The wise men bore gifts. The shepherds wore terry cloth bathrobes. And the littlest children looked like precious moments characters in their sheep's clothing. The narrators narrated, the congregation caroled. Everything went like clockwork until the arrival of the angels of the heavenly host. More children robed in white polyester robes. At the right moment that they were supposed to gather around the manger, saying glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to all. And that is what they did exactly, except for this. There was a bit of jockeying going on all around with the crowded Christmas characters on the stage. There was no room on the stage for everyone. A girl that was about nine years old, who was smaller than most of them, ended up so far out in the fringes of things that not even by craning her neck or by standing on tiptoe could she see what was going on. They continued, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to all. And they all sang on cue. And then in the momentary pause that followed, the small girl electrified the entire church by crying out in a voice shrill with irritation and frustration and enormous sadness at having her view blocked, saying, Let Jesus show! This is the Christmas message. Let Jesus show. Let's not hide Jesus. Let's not crowd out Jesus with all the season's trappings and distractions. Let Jesus show. Let Jesus show in our lives. Let Jesus show here in Emmanuel. Let Jesus show in the world. Let's give Jesus the front stage.
We continue reading from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 2. In those days a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered, and Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and whom was expecting a child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him in the inn. The most intense debate in church history has been over the divinity of Christ. But I think one of the greatest errors that we can make is to deny the humanity of Christ. I love this quote from Martin Luther, where he says, the deeper that we can bring Christ into the flesh, but we are never able to do so enough, the better. Now, the book of Hebrews reminds us that Christ shared in our humanity, that he was made like his brothers and sisters in every way. This tells us that our God really wants to get to know us, to identify with us, to be down to earth, relatable and approachable. God's ultimate act of identification is the incarnation. God was in Christ reconciling the world. Think about it. Jesus has a genealogy. He's got a family tree. Suddenly, all those begats in Matthew's gospel don't seem so boring. He wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. In fact, he was born in a place that was more suited for animals. Like all babies, Jesus got fussy when he was hungry for milk. Mary and Joseph needed to change his diapers, and they smelled. He gave them many sleepless nights. See, Jesus loves you so much that he went through puberty and middle school for you and for me. He had to learn a job, a vocation, that of carpentry, that he learned from his adopted earthly father, Joseph. Jesus probably hit his finger a time or two pounding nails, but he didn't ever cuss. He caught colds. He had sleepless nights. He thirsted. He wept. Jesus rested. He wanted and he needed to get alone to pray and to recharge. He felt the pains of suffering and self-denial, being betrayed and suffering, ultimately death. You see, Jesus shows us what God is like. He is the human face of God, but he also knows what it's like to be human. So with Christ in us, we're called to live in the same way, to go out to others in Jesus' name, in his strength, to put a human face to Jesus' love for the world.
The original Advent calendar was an ancient Latin hymn called the O Antiphons. This prayer includes seven messianic titles, which form a backward acrostic in Latin, Ero Cross, which means tomorrow I will come. We also know the O Antiphons from the Christmas carol, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And so I invite you to pray the prayer refrain with me, which is Come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. O wisdom, coming forth from the mouth of the Most High, pervading and permeating all creation, you order all things with strength and gentleness. Come now and teach us the way to salvation. Come, Lord Jesus. O Adonai, ruler of the house of Israel, you appeared in the burning bush to Moses and gave him the law on Sinai. Come with outstretched arm to save us. Come, Lord Jesus. O Root of Jesse, rising as a sign for all the peoples, before you earthly rulers will keep silent and nations give you honor. Come quickly to deliver us. Come, Lord Jesus. O Key of David, scepter over the house of Israel, you open and no one can close, you close and no one can open. Come to set free the prisoners who live in darkness and the shadow of death. Come, Lord Jesus. O radiant dawn, splendor of eternal light, son of justice, come shine on those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death. Come, Lord Jesus. O ruler of the nations, Monarch for whom the people long, you are the cornerstone uniting all humanity. Come, save us all whom you formed out of clay. Come, Lord Jesus. O Emmanuel, our sovereign and lawgiver, desire of the nations and savior of all, come and save us, O Lord our God. Come, Lord Jesus. God of grace, you are ever faithful to your promises. The earth rejoices in hope of our Savior's coming and looks forward with longing to his return at the end of time. Prepare our hearts to receive him when he comes, for he is Lord forever and ever. And now with the confidence of God's children, we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Please join me in our prayer of dedication. God of wonder, we offer you these humble gifts that are signs of your goodness and your mercy. Receive them with our gratitude that through us all people may know the riches of your love in the word made flesh. Amen. We continue reading through Luke 2. In that region there were shepherds living in their fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Why is it a holy night? Why did Jesus come? What difference does Jesus make? Yaroslav Pelikan notes of all the historical figures throughout the centuries, Jesus stands out as the most influential. It is by Christ's birth that most calendars in our world mark their time. And by the name of Jesus, millions curse. And in his name, millions pray. Like a kaleidoscope, each culture over the millennia portrays Jesus with different nuances and emphases. Yet, simultaneously, the living Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as the book of Hebrews tells us. See, Jesus came not only for the manger, but Jesus came for the old rugged cross. He defeated death so that we might live. Jesus came also to forgive us, to give us a, a fresh start, a new life, to be born again. He frees us from the bondage of sin and he sets us free from ourselves. Jesus shows us the face of God. Jesus shows us what it means to be not only godly, but truly human. And he upholds the dignity of people from every single race. Jesus shows us what it looks like to love God and to love our brother and our sister and to love our enemy. But he also works in us. Jesus is born in us. Jesus lives in us and helps us to do what we cannot do on our own. He makes us holy. He silences and stills the dark night of our soul, giving us a heavenly peace. All we can do is fall on our knees in worship, then follow wherever he leads.
Anne Weems wrote these words in her poem, Kneeling in Bethlehem. Each year the child is born again. Each year some new heart finally hears, finally sees, finally knows love. And in heaven there is great rejoicing. There is a festival of stars. There is celebration among the angels. For in the finding of one lost sheep, the heart of the shepherd is glad. And Christmas has happened once more. The child is born anew, and one more knee is bowed. Now receive the charge and the benediction. May Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, who comes with healing in his wings, fill you with the joy and the peace that passes all understanding. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you now and always. And all God's saints said, Amen!